Edward Tenor is the ideal speaker for a school like Stevens. National Public Radio calls him, quote, the philosopher of everyday technology. His books include Our Own Devices, How Technology Remakes Humanity, and the classic bestseller, Why Things Bite Back, Technology and the Revenge of Unintended Consequences. Ed is best known for showing how our attempts to manipulate the world often go awry. As the Air Force engineer Edward Murphy complained more than 50 years ago, anything that can go wrong will. But according to Ed, Murphy's Law is, quote, not a fatalistic, defeatist principle. It's a call for alertness and adaptation. In other words, Ed is not a Luddite or a technology pessimist who believes that every human step forward leads inevitably to a stumble or step backward. He just wants us to be aware of and prepared for what can happen when technologies are released into our complicated world. This is an important message for both consumers and designers of technology. Ed earned his PhD from the University of Chicago, and he's an historian of technology and culture and a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, and the Smithsonian's Lemelson Center. We have copies of Why Things Bite Back for sale today, right down here. And Ed would be delighted to sign them at the end of his talk. So Ed has traveled all the way from South Carolina to get here today through rain and sleet and snow. So please give him an extra warm welcome to Steve. Thank you very much, John, for that, that kind introduction. I'm, I'm really so pleased to be here, and I want to uh, thank uh, John, the Center for uh, Science Writings, and, uh, and Stevens for uh, this, this opportunity. I should say that I'm, I'm especially happy to speak at engineering schools because what I write is really made possible by the insight of engineers into safety, into unintended consequences. Many, many of the concepts that I use are, are those that were developed by engineers themselves in thinking about how things go wrong. I could name, for example, my friend and colleague Henry Rakoski as somebody who has written uh, wonderful, wonderful books on, on the subject. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm, um, I also think that, that it isn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing to, uh, to, to explore further all of the uh, all of the complications of, of, of technology because one of the things that has struck me over and over again is how often uh, technologies that were intended to make us safer can, can actually lead to uh, new forms of disaster. I, put, I could actually extend this to our present financial crisis. After all, I am now in a building at Princeton, have a visiting office in a building that is devoted to, uh, in part, to financial engineering. And this, this monument to the discipline of financial engineering was completed this, uh, this, uh, this, this September. And maybe it should be uh, rechristened the Center for Financial Reengineering. And maybe we need financial engineers more than others. But it also uh, illustrates some of the, some of the risks that, that are inherent when we apply engineering, uh, engineering concepts. Well, I, there are really three parts to, um, to what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. I'm going to start by introducing the 19th century urban environment, which was one of constant occupational and epidemiological hazards that are difficult to imagine today. In fact, there was even a heroic cult of risk. But conversely, it was a time of magnificent innovations in public health and safety, some of them, like parts of the London sewer system, still in use today. In the second part, I'm going to look at the mechanisms by which human behavior subverts technological safety, normalization of deviance, risk compensation, practical drift, and counterproductive control. Each of these may bear on some measures that might be applied, for example, to risks like uh, biosecurity. And finally, in the third part, I'll consider the rise of 
what I would call the biological mechanical interface in which safety, safer technology has introduced new threats and also I'll talk about the practical difficulties of predicting human risks. So I want to emphasize though that that I am not at all, um, as, as John was saying, I'm not at all uh, an, an opponent of technological uh, approaches to, to anything, but, but I also want to emphasize that avoiding, avoiding all unintended consequences also has unintended consequences. So there's no, there's no real totally safe position. We, we really have to proceed from the mistakes that we've made and, and uh, try to limit the dangers from those that we are certain to make in the, uh, in the future if, if we're going to solve any problems. Well, let me start with this idea from the 19th century of the assumption of risk, because this was very basic to employment law. Uh, no matter what happened to you at work, the idea was that when you accepted the job, you really were realizing that, that all kinds of bad things could happen. This happened uh, not that far from here. It was an accident at the Camden and Amboy Railroad. And in the absence of uh, switching systems as we, uh, and uh, safety signal systems as we know them, there were, uh, there were really uh, terrible, uh, terrible disasters. Breaking was also primitive. In this 1855 uh, Camden and Amboy crash, for example, there were 81 people killed and 75 people wounded. Now we think of a brakeman's life of the, of the 19th century as really a kind of romantic, uh, romantically gliding through these magnificent uh, landscapes. We can romanticize it, but actually, it, in, in reality, it was one of uh, jumping from car to car in, in freezing weather. Uh, uh, imagine like the weather we've just had. And it was no accident then that uh, artificial limb makers were among the largest advertisers in, in railroad magazines in, in, the, in the late uh, 19th century. The yard work would be just as hazardous. Um, the Westinghouse air brake was patented as early as 1869, but it took 30 years for air brakes and automatic couplers to become law. Uh, and they did so really because the traveling public exerted political pressure and also, of course, because virtually all members of Congress travel to Washington with the same railroads. Uh, this is a, 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 a diagram of, of one of the early braking systems. And this is a, a, the coupler of the kind that was introduced over 100 years ago and is still in widespread use. In the United States, the anthropologist Anthony Wallace has studied the mining communities of the anthracite regions, which aren't so far from here. Mine owners believed themselves to be the heroes of industry, and actually they took incredible risks with their own lives in addition to having uh, what they felt were necessarily dangerous working conditions for the miners. Uh, the anthracite region had unusually and has unusually deep seams. This is a, a schematic of, of, of one. And the workers echoed the, the miner, the, the mine owners' attitudes. They were also heroic. They believed in toughness. And they really had, had very little in the way of uh, protective equipment. From the 1870s or 80s to uh, 1912, there was really uh, very little change in, in how uh, coal was mined. This is a, a miner, and uh, you can see, I think, that's a, that's a candle on, on, a, on a stiffened uh, cap on his, his head. You can see there was very little change uh, until the First World War. And then there was a very interesting positive unintended consequence that I've written about in Our Own Devices in my chapter on helmets. Um, because of the nature of artillery in the First World War, for the first time in centuries, it was routine to wear uh, protective metal helmets. And when they returned from the First World War, uh, many miners brought them home and started to use them in the, uh, in, in the mines. And the helmets spread from mining to other professions. This, is a, uh, this helmet belonged to a miner in, uh, in Minnesota in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, the helmets, for example, started to be used in the, uh, in the shipyards shortly after World War I. And then they spread to construction sites, for example, on the, on the Golden Gate Bridge. It was mandatory to wear helmets. All this was an indirect 
an unintended consequence of the style of warfare of the First World War. 19th century cities like my native Chicago were tinderboxes. It doesn't matter if it was Mrs. O'Leary's cow that kicked over the lantern. In dry weather, any spark could set off a conflagration. And uh, it took a, a long time, but after, after the, uh, the Civil War, <coughs> excuse me, after the, uh, the Great Fire, uh, the building codes gradually uh, were introduced that made the city a model of resilience and a fireproof construction. So by 18, thank you very much. By 1893, this was the Monadnock building. It was the world's tallest at the time, and it's still in use. So sometimes a disaster can pave the way for a, a creative adaptation. In 1854, there was a, an enormous uh, cholera epidemic in, in uh, London. It was actually the unintended consequence of a sanitary measure of closing the cesspit so that the polluted water uh, went into the, the Thames, where, of course, it was a source of drinking water. Um, this led to the 1858 uh, Great great Stink, uh, where the Houses of Parliament were almost uninhabitable. Well, uh, they, there was an engineer um, named Sir Joseph Bazalgette. Uh, here, by the way, this is, a, this is a, a French depiction of how cholera, even in the late 19th century, was, was still an enormous hazard, and of the, uh, the effects of cholera in, in, uh, in London in the uh, later 19th century. So uh, Sir Joseph Bazalgette designed the London sewer system that would drain sewage and empty it downstream from users. And it was an interesting thing about Bazalgette that when he started it, there really wasn't any known way to pour concrete that would really be suitable and that would not collapse under the weight of traffic. And he, he really had to develop it as he went along. And part of the procedure was testing each batch of concrete as it was poured. And he was so good at it that the parts of his system are still in use in London today, a really a great role model for, uh, for engineers and everyone else. And there was also a wonderful aesthetic sense this is the uh, beautiful Abbey Mills pumping station, which is still in use with, uh, with, with new equipment. So we, we have a lot to learn from the Victorians and their responses to, uh, to disasters. Um, well, safety technology also brought new kinds of problems that were less the result of failures of the technology than of, of behavioral risk. Um, the social technologies uh, have a tendency to uh, defeat uh, technological uh, safeguards. And one of the consequences, one of the concepts that sociologists of, of technology uh, have, have developed, and this, this, was, uh, this was the idea of Diane Vaughan and, and her analysis of the Space uh, Shuttle Challenger disaster and the failure of the O-rings, is the normalization of deviance. That is, that the failure was not really the O-rings themselves but the decisions of NASA managers to keep on schedule uh, despite unsafe weather conditions. So a, a culture can permeate even a technical organization where people have engineering degrees and, and people can convince themselves that keeping on schedule, keeping under budget is, is really worth compromising engineering uh, principles. So the, unfortunately, these tragedies are really reminders of what happens when engineering principles are disregarded. This is uh, Richard Feynman, of course, explaining the, the, uh, the, the, the failure uh, mechanism of the, uh, the O-rings. Um, and um, we saw in the 2003 Columbia breakup when a piece of foam insulation from a, uh, from a fuel tank broke off on launch. This had been a known problem, and again, there was a uh, there had been a generational shift in organizations, a generational shift in, in, um, in, in NASA, and the lessons of 1986 uh, had, been, um, had, been, had been lost. Another example of the normalization of deviance uh, occurred in uh, Jacksonville Beach, uh, Florida. This was uh, analyzed by Henry Petrosky recently, an, an American scientist. It was a, a condominium construction crane. And this, to me, was a, was a really interesting case because um, uh, Petrosky showed how uh, it was really caused by the routine, routine use of workarounds that defeated the built-in safety interlock. So normally, 
you know, normal, normal deviance. Normally, the operators would use a penny to circumvent an interlock that kept the crane from being in a position where it was likely to topple. And the reason was that both the managers and the workers really wanted to maximize production, maximize the, the speed, and an experienced worker could find ways to, under normal conditions, to operate safely even with the, the interlock disabled. But what really happened, really tragically, was that when substitute workers came on, they were unfamiliar with this workaround system. And so one of the most uh, dangerous uh, technologies turned out to be a US penny that was used to, uh, to, defeat, to defeat the system. So, this illustrates that you can build all kinds of safeguards into a technology, but if the culture of the organization is such that people really uh, are rewarded for not believing in it, then that there are really uh, very serious hazards and, and you, you may have a false sense of security. There's also a concept in risk analysis of risk compensation. That is that we take original risks uh, because we have safety equipment. Well, everybody's read about Benjamin Franklin's uh, proposal for the lightning rod, but fewer people know, actually, about his, um, this is a Franklin uh, a lightning rod, I think, in the, in the collection of the American Philosophical Society, but, but few people know about his uh, French translator and disciple, a man named Barbeau de Boeuf, who invented uh, the lightning rod umbrella. <laughs> Uh, one, of the, one of the less uh, promising safety innovations of the 18th century. And actually, he, he willed this, he thought highly enough of this, that he willed this to Benjamin Franklin, and for all I know, it is still in the collections of the American Philosophical Society. I haven't had a chance to, uh, to ask them. But this was not limited to gentlemen, by the way. Uh, ladies, uh, this, this may not be entirely clear, but you can see trailing from the, uh, the lady's hat there is, a, there is also a, uh, a, a grounding wire. Um, so uh, uh, fortunately, we don't know of any, uh, any, any uh, casualties of, of, of this, but uh, it, it still must have been quite a sight to, to see people turn out for a smart uh, Paris uh, event carrying these, these, new, uh, these new safety uh, devices. In the early 19th century, um, about 50 years after Barbara de uh, there was one of the most famous safety innovations. This was Humphrey Davy's miner's lamp for detecting methane and avoiding the hazards of, of open candles. It was invented in 1816 in response to a tragedy at Jarrow in, in 1812 where 91 miners were killed in a pit explosion. Again, this is the kind of thing that happened a lot in the 19th century. Well, mine owners gave Davy a medal, but actually, in the way in which they used the lamp, they at, were, were, were exploiting deeper and more hazardous seams. So actually, from the workers' standpoint, uh, accidents didn't decrease at all until the late 19th century, when there was a new round of mine uh, safety legislation. And not only that, but workers sometimes actually touched off uh, touched off explosions, lighting their pipes with the, with the safety lamp. And in fact, Davy's rivals called it the murder lamp. In 19th century safety technology, maybe one of the most famous devices was uh, King C. Gillette's uh, safety razor. This is the old-fashioned uh, straight razor, still available today, by the way, and there's even a, a, uh, a cult of the straight razor. You can, you can see newspaper articles about men learning to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to use these again. But, um, there, there was really an interesting paradox of the, of the safety razor. Uh, this is uh, G Gillette's, or one of Gillette's key original patents for the safety razor. The, uh, the reason for the safety razor, by the way, was not so much, as Gillette invented it, was not so much safety as convenience. The thing that a lot of men really hated in the 19th century was not so much the nicks from the blades, it was the skill that was needed in, in properly honing a straight razor blade. And men were advised to get lessons from their barber and how to do it. Well, you can imagine how enthusiastic a barber would be in, in, in 
and getting a little bit of money in order to deprive himself of all income from uh, future future shapes. So I'm not sure about the, the quality of that instruction. So Gillette's idea was really not so much safety, because there had been other uh, fixed safety model razors, but it was really disposability. He was the uh, originator in a lot of ways, not the originator of the throwaway society, but he worked for a company that made bottle caps, still existing, crown, cork, and seal. And his boss at this company, where he was a salesman, advised him if he really wanted to make a lot of money, what he should do is invent something like a crown, cork, and seal that people would use once or twice and, and, then, and then throw away. And he, he, uh, he proceeded to, uh, uh, to do that. Gillette had previously been an unsuccessful uh, book author, so there, there may be hope for those of us in the, in the threatened uh, writing trade that we can, we can find some, some form of, uh, of disposable object and, and make our, our fortune that way. But it's interesting that the, the safety razor, the disposable safety razor, although it, it may have been safer for shaving, uh, also introduced, especially in its double um, uh, double blade variety, it introduced the new kinds of risk. It, households, for example, well into the 20th century had medicine chests with, um, with slots for receiving razor blades. And the razor blades didn't go into a little box built into the, um, the medicine cabinet as, as I thought they did when they were grow, growing up. This slot was actually designed to just send that blade into the area between the, uh, the, the studs of the wall. It just, it just became part of the house. And so it later became a very serious hazard when houses were being, uh, were, were being remodeled. So again, it's a lesson in how the long-term life cycle of a product actually can introduce all kinds of, of safety uh, problems that, that might not have been anticipated at first. Then consider another famous safety technology, the safety bicycle that was introduced in the 1890s. Now there's a very good study of bicycle history by a Dutch historian of technology with the very appropriate name of Professor Biker, B-I-J-K-E-R. And you know, Professor, Professor Biker made an excellent point that the dangers of a high wheel bicycle were, were also its features. That is, that this high wheel was really the favorite of athletic young men who like to show off, as, as here in a, uh, in, in a, in a wonderful uh, 19th century magazine drawing. Uh, they love to, to show off going through the countryside of these, uh, but they were also facing the risk of, of breaking their necks. But that wasn't a bug, that was a feature in this cult because it was, a, it was an ex exceedingly macho thing to be riding one of these bicycles. So real men knew how to take a header. Now, what, what really happened was that the pneumatic tire and the lower frame uh, made bicycles appeal to, uh, to, to young women and uh, even to, to uh, the middle-aged uh, middle people. Um, but the bicycle prevailed in part even among the young men because it actually, the safety bicycle was faster than the high wheel bicycle. So there was no point to incurring this danger anymore if you didn't even have the excuse that it was faster than the reform bicycles. But on the other hand, the bicyclist's better road movement also helped to bring about the automobile because the, the roads that were improved for the bicyclists then became uh, really suitable for drivers and thus it brought about a new set of, uh, of hazards uh, not only automobile accidents like this one, and you can see the standard of car construction in the early automobile days, but it, it, it also brought about news hazards for the bicyclists who, who had literally paved the way for the cars. Um, and th this, of course, the, 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 the airbag is, is, a, uh, is a reflection of a change of mentality. The, the original the drivers of, in the early automobile age were not terribly uh, uh, conscious of it. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the drivers, um, the people who are now driving safer cars have tended to buy uh, more dangerous equipment for the home. So riding lawnmowers 
uh, are, are a very serious cause of accidents because on uneven terrain, uh, most of them have been have been uh, very likely to uh, to uh, to tip, and they, they they can be they can be highly unstable. So there is a tendency then for people, consciously or unconsciously, once something has been safer, to take greater risks. Uh, this is a um, a, a, a set of uh, of the um, it's, it's not it's not that that easy to um, see. This is a set of the of the colors that are worn by uh, by the uh, crewmen on a and women on the, the decks of uh, of aircraft. This is an example of the of the way in which safety, once it's made a goal, uh, can be um, and it's a goal of the whole organization. Uh, can be implemented in, in situations that, that seem to be impossibly dangerous. Uh, this is these here are the, the here's the crew assembled with their various colors on on an aircraft deck. But on the other hand, the problem that the military has discovered is that the same people who achieve this great level of safety and teamwork in in combat and, and on, on board the, the ships actually have an alarming rate of accidents when they're driving to and from the base. So the safety programs of the military are even more directed toward uh, road safety than they are toward, the, uh, toward the, the actual performance, just because people have been so well trained for that, but in many cases they seem to, to take out a, a taste for, for danger in their private lives. Um, there are also New risks uh, that that come from new uh, new technologies of, of uh, protection. For example, we looked a while ago at the at the helmet and how the spread of the helmet was really an indirect consequence of the First World War. Well, the um, bicycle helmets are now, fortunately, and I think it's a good thing, are, are really mandatory for for children and are are an excellent idea for adults. And I'm not criticizing them at all, but it's a very interesting thing about about uh, helmets that that in a lot of cases the rate of accidents seems to go up a bit after people start wearing helmets. Some people say it, it is because helmeted people start to take greater risks. But there's another factor too, and that was discovered by a um, by a British uh, psychologist who had a helmet uh, fitted with a, a camera. This isn't the psychologist, but one of the things that he discovered as he rode in traffic and later analyzed the, the videos that he had taken in the process was that when somebody is wearing a helmet, other drivers, the drivers of motor vehicles, tend to crowd them in more. They, they are actually taking greater risks with the, uh, with the bicyclists, when the bicyclists appear to be safer, although there's nothing, nothing really logical about that. That's just the way they behave. And this researcher found that if he wore a wig that, that made him seem to be a female a bicyclist, that actually that worked to get the, uh, the, the drivers to keep a, a, greater, uh, a greater distance. So the, these, uh, the, there really are uh, paradoxical uh, and unexpected results of, of many of these uh, safety uh, techniques. Also in, in, um, in sports, uh, the early 19th century Athletes uh, were wearing uh, leather helmets, lightweight leather helmets that that were not terribly good for for protection. Uh, in uh, more recently, especially after the Second World War, the plastic helmets came in. But it was discovered that uh, players equipped with plastic helmets were changing their style, and very often they would be using them aggressively in a technique called spearing. So the body would act as a as a battering ram, and that would often uh, result in, a, in a, uh, a very dangerous load on the spine. So if there were many accidents, the practice was outlawed, but it was not, not terribly easy to believe. So again, uh, there is an element of behavioral risk when you introduce a safety technology, but you don't look at the whole set of implied rules, institutions, uh, coaching, the, the penalties that are involved for various kinds of behavior, just as we saw that the safety devices and construction sites could be defeated and lead to more dangerous operations. 
in boxing too, early 19th century boxing was really bloody. Uh, and people were marked on, on how uh, jaws were broken and, and people were, were, were really terribly bruised. But it was self-limiting. That is, a, a fighter would swing only so hard because he risked breaking his own hand. In the later 19th century, in order to make boxing a more acceptable sport for the middle class, the rules were changed and gloves were introduced. And this reduced a certain kind of injury, the bloodier injury, but it introduced another kind of damage, which is that the, uh, the boxer's heads were often rotated by the blows with the gloves. And this resulted in, uh, in damage to the nerves that, that ultimately, in many cases, led to, led to Parkinsonism. And I've argued in Why Things Like That that it was very typical of many 19th century and 20th century safety technologies and also medical technologies that they helped to convert catastrophic risk into chronic risk. In other words, instead of having a, a really um, a very sharp disaster that, that, that was focused at, at, at one point and often led to, to death or, or permanent disablement, you had a gradual accumulation of smaller insults to the body and that over time these could really become as serious but it was much harder to see them happening. And I think it's characteristic also of early 20th century problems that they're less likely to be the immediate uh, disasters that we saw earlier and they're more likely to be a slow, continuous, often imperceptible accumulations of chemicals or of, of small um, small uh, blows that then lead to uh, much more uh, much more serious ones. In the late 19th century too, people thought they had the answer to the great theater fires that were as serious as the railroad crashes and the, the steamboat explosions. And this was the asbestos curtain. When, when people saw asbestos in the late 19th century, it was, it was not something that, that led them to send for a remediation contractor. This was, this was an assurance of their safety from the terrible theatrical fires that had, that had occurred earlier. Uh, but as in the case of the, the Iroquois uh, Theater in, uh, in Chicago in, in 1913, although asbestos made the spectators feel secure, in the absence of other fire safety measures, it could be useless. This is, this is exactly what happened in this tragic Chicago uh, fire where there were, um, there were really uh, hundreds of, of, of casualties, maybe the greatest of the theater fires, which really showed the limit of the asbestos curtain. This is another view of it. And um, it, there, there were, it, it, uh, it was an event that, that really has not, for some reason, not lasted that much in the consciousness of Chicago. It was, it was immense at the time. And now, of course, we have asbestos uh, remediation, which is, a, um, which is an enormous uh, industry in its own right and sometimes leads to health problems of its own. And, um, and so you, 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 even now there is controversy in, uh, in how we are handling the compensation for, uh, for asbestos. Actually, one of the interesting things that I saw when I saw a documentary on uh, asbestos at a W.R. Grace plant in Montana was that the workers themselves through their unions never really protested working with asbestos because they were afraid that if they asked for uh, more safety equipment, the, the mine would be shut down. So another paradox of safety is that sometimes the people who should be the greatest beneficiaries really feel economically that they have no choice. But I'd like to turn now to another kind of risk of safety, which is a, uh, uh, which was a phrase that coined by a uh, Harvard professor of business now who was, uh, who was an Air Force officer who was uh, injured by uh, friendly fire in the Vietnam War and on the basis of that experience really got to, to thinking about organizational problems. The name is Scott Snook, S-N-O-O-K, and he calls that practical drift. Um, and if you can see, for example, that we've had a very successful campaign against, uh, against smoking and, and, uh, and uh, deaths are, are expected to, to decrease from that source. On the other hand, um, one of the things that people look for in the absence of, 
of cigarettes. They, they, uh, there's now a turn toward, uh, toward aromatic candles, and there are more and more fires that have been reported starting in the, in the 1890s uh, from the, uh, the burning of these candles in, in, in apartments. So people's behavior can sometimes change in, in, these, uh, in, in these unexpected ways. There, was also, uh, there were also elements of, uh, of uh, practical drift in the implementation of, uh, of uh, marine safety. This is, a, um, this is, of course, the, the uh, uh, view of the Titanic, and there are, there are any number of theories. I, I, I really, I'm really not going to talk so much about the, 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 the Titanic here, but about another ship called the Eastland. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Eastland? Well, it, it went down in uh, Chicago Harbor uh, in, in, uh, in 1915. And one of the reasons, there's a, there's a very good book about it. Um, one of the reasons for this was that it was never uh, terribly uh, seaworthy to begin with. It, it was always kind of unstable. But after the Titanic sank, uh, there was a movement for lifeboats for all. And so the Eastland, which originally had been on Lake Erie and was transferred to being a cruise ship on Lake Michigan, was retrofitted with lifeboats. But the problem was that in order to do that, they had to stiffen the decks with concrete. And that made the Eastland even more unstable than it had been. And it actually capsized while being overloaded with workers from a Western Electric plant in, in the uh, in the, in the Chicago suburbs. And the, the civilian casualties, or the number of passenger casualties, deaths was actually comparable to the Titanic. But it didn't go into even Chicago law, let alone national passenger, national law, because the victims of the Titanic had come from really all over the world, or at least all over the West, and they included a lot of prominent people. The victims of the Eastland all came from one neighborhood. They were all workers at one plant complex. And, and so if you, if you think of that as, as a network, the social network kind of folded in on itself. Uh, you, would be, you would either know nobody who was there or else you'd be going to one funeral after another. So I discovered after writing about this that there are still many people there. There's still a, a great collective memory among the descendants of Eastland survivors in, in that part of Chicago. On the other hand, people elsewhere in Chicago, uh, unless they're professionally concerned with safety or enthusiasts of Chicago history, probably have not, have not heard about it. Uh, this is the, uh, the Andrea Doria. This was another uh, really, uh, really famous, um, famous case of, uh, of a marine um, accident. And uh, the, the Andrea Doria, uh, collided with uh, a Swedish ship called the Stockholm. And this was an interesting case of what is now called uh, by, by Charles Perrow, an author of Normal Accidents and others, uh, radar assisted collision. Uh, the, the Stockholm had the latest in radar, but there was a problem in the design of the Stockholm's radar equipment. And that is that the, there were really two settings. There was a close setting and a far setting. And it was not easy to see immediately what mode the system was in. And the navigation, o navigation officer of the Stockholm thought that he was, he was working on, the, on the, uh, the larger scale, but actually it was on the smaller scale. So it really was much closer than he thought. And, and because of the presence of radar, the two ships really maneuvered themselves into a, um, into a collision course. And even today, if you look in the literature, this is something from a, a, an insurance company uh, magazine on, uh, on, on marine hazards, you will see that, uh, you, you'll see I, I, uh, I've uh, underscored there the, 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 the widespread adoption of new collision avoidance uh, technology uh, has had no discernible effect on the high incidence of collisions. And it goes on to say, that, that even this, this latest technology, because of the way in which it's, it's implemented, because of the organization, because of the way in, in which people are trained, we have not yet seen the, the, the benefits of it. So this is a lesson to engineers that, that it's not enough to, 
to, uh, to work on a system and to have safeguards built in, but you really have to think of human behavior as part of that system and to, to really incorporate the training um, and, and ethics into, um, into it and also to be sure that, that both the management and, and labor unions are committed or else no safety technology really is able to, uh, to reduce the, the uh, rate of deaths and injuries. And I'd like to go to what, what I think it was uh, maybe one of the most, maybe the most interesting case of, of safety technology going awry. Uh, this is, of course, the safety pin as we know it. This is an 1881 patent that has been virtually uh, unchanged. Uh, there were earlier forms of pin, but this was the first one that was really designed to be produced efficiently by an assembly line. Its, it's technical name is actually the Clinton, the Clinton pin. And this is the original patent for it. You can see that it, unlike other pins, which, which were often very complicated, this one involved a limited number of operations of bending and sharpening and attaching the head. So this made the mass production of safety pins in very large numbers uh, very cheap. And the ad, of course, uh, emphasized that, that this, this made uh, pins uh, extremely safe for, for children around the house. And today, we were talking about Wikipedia a while ago uh, uh, among ourselves, and, and today you can see that in the Wikipedia article for the safety pin, I've circled it, you can say it is safe because the sharp needle tip is covered when the safety pin is, is closed. Uh, the safety pin uh, continues to say this, the safety pin is strong, safe, and, and very durable. So this is, this is, in, uh, this is the Wiki Wikipedia uh, analysis of the safety pin. Well, uh, there was a, a famous doctor named Chevalier Jackson at the turn of the century, really up until the 1950s. And Dr. Jackson called the safety pin the danger pin. And he invented a special instrument for extracting open safety pins from the throats of people who had swallowed them. In fact, if you go to the Mutter Museum, the Museum of the Philadelphia College of, of uh, Physicians, you can see a little chest of drawers that was made for the objects that Dr. Jackson extracted from people's throats. It's, it's a kind of, uh, of medical archaeology of the small objects of the early 20th century. But safety pins were, were actually uh, his, his bête noire, and he, he called the safety pin the danger pin, and he had, he had, he mounted safety pins in, in uh, and this is a smaller one, he mounted safety pins sometimes in very, very large displays, the safety pins that he had extracted to show just how dangerous they had been. And the reason is that because of the name safety pin, people will leave opened and unopened safety pins around in greater numbers than they otherwise would. And even now, for example, in the Middle East, um, where there is a custom of pinning blue beads to children's sleep suits, um, these were replaced by, by safety pins, and there is now a, a, an unfortunately very high incidence of injuries from safety pin in, ingestion. Again, because of, a, because of this interaction between a, an old social custom and, and, and a new technology, and that is one of the frequent risks that you find. Of course, our safety pins are also prominent in, uh, in, in punk culture and, and have some, some medical hazards as such, too. Now, I'd like to uh, get getting toward the end to, to, to look at something actually that, that has, a, has a definitely has a, a Stevens connection. That is the history of the reclining chair. Uh, this is a medical chair co-invented by a Hungarian uh, uh, history teacher named Anton Lorenz, uh, and you can see that it has a back and a footrest, uh, that the back will go down as the footrest comes up, and he validated that this was an optimal position for the human body through experiments at one of the, at one of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes in, in Germany, people suspended in, sorry, people suspended in, in tanks of salt water. Well, he moved to America, Anton Lorenz, and he became an inventor of reclining wheelchairs and later on of reclining lawn furniture. This is the his, his key invention derived from that earlier one of his, the, 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 the medical siesta chair. This is the Barca Loafer, which turned into the Barca Lounger, and that really is the origin of the reclining chair uh, industry as we know it. And 
he had all kinds of medical theories about how the tired executive could come home and lean back for 20 minutes and rest and rejuvenate his heart. And in the, uh, in the archives that, uh, of his that I've seen in Germany, there is actually a sheaf of doctor's prescriptions for reclining chairs. Um, and also an FTC action about the medical claims that he was making. But the irony, of course, is that he, he was a, really an old, old world European who uh, really saw this as something he did for only 20 minutes. And I know the engineer of Stevens graduate who worked with him in developing refining chair mechanisms. And uh, Peter Fletcher uh, tells me that he and, and uh, he especially has, has really regretted the the rise of the couch potato because this was absolutely was not uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lorenz's intention. Well, let's get to I think what is one of the biggest biggest issues now in, in safety, which is uh, the, the interaction, uh, which is the the um, the interaction of, uh, of, of biological with. Uh, with, uh, with, with other systems. Now, I'd like to go for a minute, though, to the to the history of September 11th, uh, not far from here, and to, to one of the problems of safety technologies. There was an, an interlock at work in the World Trade Center, um, and that was designed to keep people who were trapped between floors from opening the doors and trying to exit because it was safer for them to wait there to be rescued by police or fire than to try to escape themselves. But tragically, um, some people were actually trapped that way in the World Trade Center because the interlock uh, worked too well. So you see that depending on the circumstance, the safety technology can, can actually, um, by restricting uh, people's motion, can, can actually produce it, its, uh, its opposite. And likewise, uh, in, in aviation, uh, the greatest aviation disaster in history occurred in 1977 on Tenerife in the, uh, in the Canary Islands. And the reason for that was in part the severity of Dutch safety uh, legislation. The pilot of the plane was one of the most experienced pilots in, in Europe. And he often taught courses in safety, in fact, and he was featured in KLM's ads. But Dutch safety regulation was so strict that he was afraid of losing his job and even facing prim criminal penalties if he and his crew exceeded the maximum of uh, flight time that was enacted in Dutch law. So he psychologically was disregarding all of the signals that he was getting about dangers when he was taking off in a fog on this, on this island airport. And you can see the contrast between that and, and what happened uh, not far from here in the in, in in the Hudson uh, of last week, when um, when you had another, I think another, uh, really another spirit where, where people were were um, felt freer to uh, to improvise, and also of course where, where somebody had had a kind of cross training. Uh, Chesley Schellenberger had cross had cross training in gliding in, um, in in the military, a form of training that's usually not given to pilots. So this is again a a case that, that a, a certain kind of rigidity in, a, in an organization, uh, in spite of all your safety measures, can be self-defeating. But if you have people from various backgrounds who are bringing in new concepts, you can often benefit from them. So there, there's a lot to be said for cross-training cross in the cause of safety. So I, I'd like to finally look into this, uh, this uh, biological interface because, of course, um, this, this accident was caused by a biological phenomenon, the, the multiplication of the number of geese in the, in the Northeast as a result of, of many, uh, many, different, uh, many different trends and the, the increase in the number of, of, uh, of bird strikes. Actually, it's the eagle now that is turning out to be the best uh, biological control mechanism for geese. They, they're a little bit afraid of, of falcons, but, but bald eagles really, really spook them. Um, the, um, the, the history of this really goes back to Grace Hopper, who found a bug in, the, uh, in, 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 an, early, in an early computer. And uh, actually, the, the, uh, at, at, the, uh, at the Lincoln Memorial, uh, the 
Uh, it was discovered when the, one of the first illumination systems was turned on that these lights were attracting midges. The midges were eat, eaten by spiders. The spiders were eaten by, by birds. And the bird droppings, when they were combined with, uh, with the rain and, and the pollution of Washington, were starting to erode the monument. So we, we see the beginnings of these complex systems in which, um, in which a technology lighting, a traditional construction, the biological world can produce these weird effects. The same thing is true of Legionnaires' disease, which broke out in 1976 at an American Legion conference. Legionnaires' disease was probably the first disease that ever spread from, um, from uh, human beings to machines. Uh, and they did it in this way. Uh, the leaves, these are Legionella, which are kept at, by modern heating, venting, ventilating, and air conditioning systems at exactly the, the best temperature for, for reproduction. Uh, and uh, a, a, an indirect consequence of the Legionella outbreak was the failure of many, many IBM tape drives all over the country, sim almost simultaneously. And there was a great mystery about this, and the IBM finally appointed a committee uh, of scientists from its Almaden laboratory to investigate this. And what they found was that these drives had been disabled because the bactericide that was used for combating Legionella had minute traces of tin. And if a, if a tape drive was near an air duct, the, those tin particles would be wafted and, and would be deposited on, on the tape head. So they had to reformulate the bactericide and, 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 and move the tape head. But it's a, to me, it's a really interesting illustration of how intimately associated uh, machinery and, and uh, life forms can be. Likewise, the, the new steel belted radial tires, for example, meant initially that it was hard to recycle tires. They accumulated and they uh, encouraged the multiplication of tiger mosquitoes, many of which actually had hitched rides to the United States on another innovation, the, uh, the container ship with all these containers with, with pools of water in them. So let me conclude with the one of the big questions in, in safety, and that is really the, the human role. And uh, psychologists talk about the difference between states and traits. That is, is, is human behavior really something of a matter of predisposition, of, of inherent character, or is it really uh, one that, that depends on the circumstances? And one of the problems when we're, we're really talking about many systems that have a great potential for human error or for terrorism is whether some people are inherently safer or more reliable than others. One interesting thing that's happened, it's not, it's not entirely new, ben, Benedict Arnold was originally considered a, a paragon of a, a courageous and, and, uh, and, and patriotic officer. And uh, he, would have been, he would have been a hero if people would have, everybody thought him the kind of person who would be incapable of treason. And yet, given a certain set of circumstances, he became America's uh, most infamous traitor. And of course, we, we had other people uh, more recently, uh, people who were considered to be uh, like the spy uh, uh, Hansen, uh, people who were considered by their style of life, by his devout Catholicism, by his anti-communism, to be exactly the kind of person who would be a good counterintelligence agent and who would never ever help uh, help help the Soviets, but, but that, of course, was what made him so dangerous. Um, we, we, of course, had the attribution. Uh, the Hatfield uh, seemed to be the kind of, of scientist who was kind of crazy and would, would, um, would uh, brew up his own anthrax and, and male anthrax. And then it was proved, well, he seemed to be that kind of person, but he actually didn't do it. And Bruce Ivins now uh, seems to be the kind of person who did it but there are also questions about Ivins. And this leads me to an illustration of the, the Calutron girls from the Manhattan Project. So in the, in 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you could really count on people not to ask any questions about uh, the technology that we were using. These, these young women never discussed anything about this plant. They were more accurate in uh, controlling the, the rate of uh, production of, of enriched uranium than the scientists would have been. But it was a time when people were, 
we're very, um, very obedient to authority in a way that they're not. So everything is becoming too predictable. And this leads me, as much as I, uh, I, I hate to, to, uh, to repeat a, a trite observation, it leads me to what I think is one of the, the, the great truths about, about safety engineering, that you can't make it foolproof because fools are too ingenious. Thank you very much. Instead of carrying something forward and, 
been working at it a long time and then turning it over to another profession to modify, I think at least experimentally it, it might be good to, to, uh, to look at the, to have a group of people who are, who are looking at a kind of committee or working group who are looking at a problem as a whole and who are, who each one of whom is bringing their own perspective to bear in how to design something. So for example, if you're talking about a safety system, you would have people in, in, in design who were familiar with ergonomic issues or familiar with, with, uh, with semiotics and, and other people who uh, might have experience in, in designing the, the mechanisms of, of interlocks and maybe somebody else in cognitive psychology who had studied how people actually behave with systems. But I think sometimes the problem occurs when you, you have people who develop something and and take it very far, and then it's turned over to, to other people, and, and they are applying their own discipline, but it, it may take longer that way, and more iterations for something to, to go back and forth than if people work together uh, uh, from the start. So I'm, in general, I'm in favor of a lot more cross-training. I think people from an early stage should, should be encouraged to to see what people in related disciplines are doing, what they can learn from them. And I think that one of the, one of the problems that at least some people have said about traditional engineering education has been that it, it is involved uh, uh, the mentality of the more courses, the more depth that you, that you have in your particular discipline, uh, the better. And I'm not necessarily criticizing that, but I'm saying that there's a trade-off because the more concentration you have like that, maybe the less experience you have in the kind of teamwork that actually might be more important in, uh, in the, the, the new design environment that people are facing. But, but Ed, even if you do that, you might uh, be able to uh, preclude certain failures or disasters. And it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on where that kind of work has been successful. But by the same token, isn't the thrust of your talk that we're still going to be stuck with uh, these kinds of disasters and mistakes and unintended consequences because we don't know the future and we haven't thought through all of the details? Well, I, as I said at the beginning, um, trying to avoid all mistakes and all unintended consequences also has a problem. And the problem is that you tend to freeze in uh, all, all of the problems that you have now. Hmm. So my the strategic idea that I have, I think the, the best strategy is one, not of, not of avoiding all mistakes, but of saying how can we catch mistakes as early as possible with, uh, with as few uh, adverse consequences as possible. And simulations are actually one way in which, in which that's being done. I mean, we, we still have a way to go with simulations, but simulations can now be much more sophisticated. So I'm optimistic that with more powerful software for, for doing that and, and fabricating, that certain categories of problems uh, can, be, can be caught earlier. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I don't think that the precautionary principle, just not trying anything new that may have, may have a bad effect, is, is really an answer, again, just because there are so many things that, that now are are seriously wrong that if we if we give up trying to improve things then then uh, it's not that we are at, at this wonderful equilibrium uh, and, and that will, will also I mean, when you look at how how many of the improvements that we've had have been responses to some disaster this is one of Henry Petrovsky's big themes um, then we see the value of that on the other hand I mean, Petrovsky Petrovsky does point out how professions forget over a period of 30 years uh, the mistakes that were made with the last generation. So every 30 years or so, a, a new uh, 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 there's a, a, a big bridge failure, and this leads to a, a a new style of bridge construction, and that though tends to get bigger and bigger and, and push the limits, and then after 30 years or so. There's a failure of, of that style of bridge. So I think Henry's idea is that, well, you just read all about this and you, you, know, you, 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 you take it to heart. On the other hand, it's very hard to say to somebody who is designing the, the next really 
big cable stayed suspension bridge. Look, stop, Henry Petrovsky says you're going to have you're going to have a, a terrible tragedy, and this person says, no, uh, look at the calculations we've done. It's 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 perfectly safe. But you could say something like that happened happened in finance too. Now, my, my teacher Bill McNeil has a concept, uh, the law of the conservation of catastrophe, that that these small these the one disaster leads to the to, to safety measures, and these safety measures keep uh, small-scale repetitions of that disaster from happening. But sooner or later, uh, somebody finds a way, uh, accidentally or, or deliberately, to uh, to push this new safer model to a point where it collapses, and then there is a new round. For example, uh, the the problems of a lot of the problems of executive pay now are due to the fact that executive pay was considered to be excessive. So legislators discouraged payment mainly in salaries and encouraged bonuses for performance. And of course, this led to new forms of, of behavior. We were talking about normalization of deviance, organizational drift. So it led to new forms of manipulating, uh, exaggerating, taking very optimistic levels of profit in order to further increase executive pay. And who knows what kinds, how the safeguards that we're putting into place now after the financial collapse, after the, the Madoff uh, revelations, what, what they're going to bring uh, uh, down the road. But uh, I, I, I don't know enough about that to, to speculate. I'd I just like that. One more question, maybe this should be the last one. It seems to me that the whole area of environmental remediation, um, uh, trying to forestall global warming, uh, has a huge potential for, for unintended consequences. So the, the story that I remember, um, I think this broke about a year ago, uh, I think Europe was subsidizing palm oil as a greener, uh, form of fuel, and so then there are these um, uh, regions where they are cutting down vast forests to plant palms to grow for palm oil. Yeah. And, the, and the net effect is to increase carbon dioxide and global warming. Yeah, that, that, that is a factor. I think there's another, there's something else that's involved with that, which is also an unintended consequence, and that is that the rising standards of living in, in Asia, especially, and, and Africa and elsewhere in the world have meant that there is there is an increased uh, increased demand for cooking oils. And it is this increased demand from the developing world, the result of higher living standards, which we all want from the developing world, that have led to deforestation and the planting of what, what used to be uh, rainforest with these uh, with these uh, uh, oil bearing oil bearing plant. So it's, it is, um, maybe people should have foreseen that, but I heard, I heard a lecture about it, and unfortunately there don't seem to be satisfactory replacements, so it, it puts the West in this difficult position. How can we, you know, how can we preach to these people who are using much less energy generating, much less carbon than, than we are? It's a, it's a very difficult question, but you're right, European policy was part of that. Uh, okay, maybe Last, last question. Um, there's a lot of discussion of cap and trade as a possible way of reducing greenhouse gases. Do you know of any people who are studying the unintended consequences of setting up a big cap and trade system for carbon dioxide? Um, I, I don't know the, you know, I haven't really studied the, the, uh, the, the, the mechanisms of, of those, but I'd really be, I'd be surprised if there weren't, not necessarily in what we're imagining now, but if, if if this didn't lead to to some extensive pattern that, that might not necessarily generate more greenhouse gases, but might result in, in might result in something that environmentally was at, at at least as harmful. I think whenever you're looking at just whenever you're looking at just one factor and, and you have just one goal, um, the likelihood is that you're going to be doing something um, that has a negative effect on something else that you really want to, you really regard as an equal role. I think that that has been that has been 
the pattern. So I, I know some atmospheric scientists who, who do recognize global warming, but who also say that the that a single focus on global warming to the exclusion of many other issues in the developing world, the exclusion of issues of poverty, is is a is is a, a is going to be a misguided and, and, and failed strategy. So I think there there probably would be consequences of that kind, and I, I just don't know enough about the specifics. Thanks a lot, Ed. Yeah.